Mulder Vlad here. Welcome to Cat Pick Friday's episode number 37. And once again, I'm joined by Mr. Richard Morgan. Hello. Good day to you, Vlad. I hope you're well. I'm good. I've spent the last week since our last episode coming up with a new musical genre. Because if you remember, <laughs> we had some comments about black metal. And I also gave Less Than Jake, Hello Rock View, as my album of the week, which is pure ska punk and i've come up with a mishmash of the two genres which i call death ska which is clean <laughs> upstrokes and blast beats at the same time and it's as fun as it sounds <laughs> but i hope you're good how have can you wait. been uh, first of all can't wait to hear it and second uh mostly well though we talked about this just before we went live here or like started recording I got some incredibly bad news with our car today, and I'm kind of broken right now. Let's put it that way. I'm like <laughs> incredibly frustrated. Like uh, a few days ago, our car started like when you would turn it on, it would shake quite a lot, and immediately I could tell it's not good. Uh, but like the range of like things that might be causing that is. Is from like changing a single filter somewhere to like something's really broken. And about an hour ago, I got a call fi finding out that it's definitely properly broken. And we're looking at, I don't know, 1600 euros worth of repairs. Plus, we'll be without the car until the mid of next week. So, yay. Uh, so it's yes. going to be expensive, and you'll have to travel by reindeer exclusively until yes. the car is available again. Polar Bear Express, something like that. Yeah, well, that's cool. Annoying stuff. I hate cars. I, they're super useful, but I kind of hate them as well. So yeah, tonight yeah. my car is going to the garage for its winter service. So I'm looking forward to seeing what they're going to say about that and how expensive it's going to be because it always costs. Something. Let's hope I don't have yeah. anything really wrong with it. Yeah, I'm really hoping yours wouldn't be as expensive as ours. So, yeah. Plus, we actually like we we're planning to go somewhere this weekend, but ain't gonna happen. So that kind of sucks. But <laughs> otherwise, I'm good. Thank you. <laughs> and yeah, I, I'm kind of trying to gather myself and like get excited about things we're going to talk about today because we have a bunch of guitars. That's fun. A bunch of different guitars from Epiphones to Matt Heafy Epiphones to <laughs> Fenders, Geasels, and some amps, some YouTuber, and uh, well-known musician collaborations and all kinds of things happening in the show. Before I forget, thank you so much for watching, listening, subscribing, liking, commenting, all of those things. And... This show is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, obviously, and on Putin app as well. And if you want to be part of the show and have your question answered, feel free to email us at podcast at catpickstudios.com or obviously you can leave a comment on YouTube show as well. And we will actually answer a few of your questions in the show as well from the YouTube community. So that's cool. And yeah, this is also my album pick of the week or album of our lives, my life, something like that. And at the end of the show in the weekend watch, we check out the video where a friend of ours really loves Iron Maiden and goes a long way uh, turning his Squire Strat into an Iron Maiden Strat. Really fun video. But that's at the end of the show. Oh, and I should mention, if you want to check out one of the sections of the show, there's timestamps in the show notes as well, as there are ways to support what we do here as well. Songwriting course, merch, affiliate links, stuff like that. But enough of me babbling. Let's jump to the first thing that has happened recently in the show segment called Recent Happenings, as always. <music> Ka-ching! Thing number one is the Epiphone Billy Joe Armstrong Les Paul Jr. Oh man, try to say that as fast as you can. Epiphone Billy Joe Armstrong Les Paul Jr. 
Ah. I've been practicing saying it. <laughs> give it a try. I want to... <clears throat> give it a try. <clears throat> Epiphone, Billy Joe Armstrong, Les Paul Jr. How about sense. that? Your, uh-huh. Yours was smoother than, than mine. So, yeah. well done. Well done. But, you know, if... Let's imagine we were announcing the release of a, a Finnish signature artist's guitar mm. by a Finnish company. I would probably struggle just a little bit. Possibly. Mm-hmm. As do most people But, in the world trying to pronounce Finnish. Indeed. So, exactly. I, I don't blame you. Apparently it's one of the toughest languages in the world to learn. Yeah, I've I mean, uh, for a native English speaker, I'm quite linguistically talented let's say you know i've got the german in me i speak french as well not as well as the german anymore i can order coffee in spanish believe it or not oh. yeah and i can say lojikama which is probably a terrible version of dragon in finnish or at least my attempt at it but yeah finnish you know it's if you speak a couple of different european languages you can kind of listen to italian or spanish or something else similar and sort of half pick up on things. But with Finnish, it's mm. just totally alien to me. You, you get nothing whatsoever. So, yeah. 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 Yeah, we have very few words that are similar to other languages. Obviously, like English is kind of bleeding into Finnish as well a little bit, where we, like some of the new words are kind of Englishified or something like that. So we don't like come up with a totally new Finnish word, too, but we take that English word and just kind of make it a bit Finnish. Yeah, so that's the way. Yes, but Epiphone Billy Joe after <laughs> Les Paul Junior. Epiphone is doing it again. Like, and this is not the only Epiphone we're talking about on the show today. <laughs> this looks pretty no. amazing. Simple, a punk rock beautiful. classic? Question mark. Oh yes. I mean, I don't know if you can call a brand new guitar a punk rock classic, but yeah, mm, yeah, this looks super fun. I love guitars with one pickup. I love P90 pickups. I'm a big fan of Les Paul single cut style guitars. I like Epiphone. I have a 2020 Epiphone SG, which I really, really like with an Epiphone Pro P90 soap bar in it, which is, if I'm not mistaken, yes, the same pickup as is in this guitar. And it looks like fun, except it's white. I think they could have chosen a more exciting color. I'll go ahead and say I that. I love white. I, I love as white someone, as well. Yes. Uh, as someone who's openly promoting his affection for white guitars, uh, this is right up my alley. Though I'm always skeptical about the wraparound bridge. Like, does it intonate well? Yeah. And if it doesn't, what are you going to do about it? That's the question. That is, you know, I, I haven't, <laughs> I haven't done my research. They say this is based on Billy Joe Armstrong's '56 Les Paul Junior. I'm assuming mm. that that guitar is actually white as well, and that's why this one's white. Have Have you searched for that? Uh, this is I a, haven't actually. This is a gap in my preparations for the show. I'm going to have to just <laughs> quickly Google that. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I- I'll briefly mention that it's a mahogany body with a matching vintage 50s profile neck. So 50s, that's a bit thicker neck, I think. In that. Then 12-inch radius and Indian laurel fretboard. Uh, something that Rich isn't fan of, or at least prefers rosewood when possible. Yeah, we'll get to that. <laughs> <laughs> But otherwise, it's super simple. A single... Pro P90 pickup in the bridge. Uh, the new Epiphone headstock. Is it new anymore? It's a couple of years old, I think. It, it looks very decent. Like I think the new headstock makes these guitars look more desirable to me, at least. So, well done, yeah, Epiphone. It's, yes, well done, Epiphone, indeed. This was a change that we first saw at the start of 2020. So the 2020 oh. range of Epiphone guitars yeah. were the first to have this What do they call it? The new Kalamazoo headstock shape or whatever. But it is just a small change that makes a massive difference to the overall desirability of the guitars, I would say. Yeah. So it's great. Full marks to Epiphone for that. Just looking at Google at Billy Joe with his Les Paul Juniors, 
it is kind of as I remember. I've seen him playing a Sunburst one, and I've seen him playing his black one with the tortoise shell scratch plate. Now, it's possible that he also has a white one, which this was modeled on, but I'm not entirely sure. You never know, though. If this is a successful model, if they sell a truckload of them, there will be more colors to come, I suspect, because why not? Yes, exactly. Uh, comes with a hard case as well, and it has a le- leopard print inside of the case. Yeah, <laughs> interesting that's super the cool. detail. <laughs> that's that's cool. I, I'd rather yeah, prefer that the inside is leopard print, not the outside. Yeah, good point. Actually, yeah. <laughs> but you know, <laughs> that is something which his Gibson signatures also had, I believe. So that's cool. And yeah, looking at the price on screen now, 533 euros, that is an awful lot of money for that instrument, in my opinion. But if you consider that it comes with that hard case, then you can knock 150, possibly even 200 euros off. It would be kind of cool if they offered a version without a case or with maybe a gig bag, maybe a leopard print gig bag inside and out. (laughs) But this is a cool guitar. And I feel a lot of people are going back to more simplistic instruments at the moment. There is that one thing that you just mentioned while reading through the specs, the Indian Laurel fretboard. That's another area where I'm kind of, again, personally disappointed that they skimped on doing Rosewood. If it's all about sustainability, then that's 100% cool. But if they just did it because they didn't want to pay for Rosewood to keep the prices down, then I'm not the biggest fan of that. Yeah. In stock within about one week at Thorman. So that's nice compared to... Some of the stuff we looked at last week where, was it like 13 to 15 weeks? A few boss pedals, I think, and stuff like that. So, Yeah, that's <laughs> great. This is at least available for the yeah, holiday season Yeah, and it will market. be. Yeah, Christmas season, exactly. It has a graph tech nut as well. So there you go. That's cool. Epiphone Vintage that's Deluxe cool. Tuners, which I also have on my 2020 SG. They're okay. Mm. They're, they're pretty good. The guitar stays in tune quite well in combination with a graph tech nut. That's going to be, it's going to be a fun instrument. I'd really like to yep. get one of these into my hands to give it a play. And yeah, of course, definitely. I'm a big fan of Green Day. I should say that off the bat as well. Billy Joe is a, yeah. an incredible songwriter yeah. and a great guitar player as well. I just love his melodic way of playing punk and punk rock. Yeah. I mean, it, it just looks nice and very simple. And I'm trying to think whether I've actually tried guitars like these in the past, because I might not have. You've never tried a Les Paul Jr.? Yeah, I probably need to walk into a local store at some point. Oh, by the way, uh, what were the guitars talking about last week? Uh, Because the, oh yeah, the pink PRS acoustic would be available in a local store to try out. Go do it. one with log it. Yeah, go. Maybe I need to message them and say, hey, can I stop by? If they still have it, that is. Who knows, maybe it's sold out right away. Yeah, that would also be interesting to know if it sold straight away because, you know, a pink acoustic is also a niche product. So for anybody wondering, we discussed a a new limited edition pink SE PRS. Was it Sonoran? No, that's a Fender acoustic. Uh, I can't remember the model, but... Yeah, like a parlor. So like a smaller body acoustic guitar, basically. Yep. Yep. So, yep. Cool looking guitar. And let's jump to more Epiphone stuff because, kaboom, Matt Heafy reveals, well, kind of two new Epiphone signature models. Uh, apparently his original one was sold out a while ago already. And by the way, I have to mention, it's really cool that he's actually playing the same guitars in his band. So he's actually yes. playing the guitars he's selling. And that's pretty Absolutely. amazing. So th- there's uh, a six-string one, which is a bit more traditional, less ball shape, uh, 24.75 inch scale. But then there's also a seven-string one, or like, or like there will be a seven-string one, which is 25.5 inch inch scale length I wasn't able to find a picture of the 7 string one just yet but uh, yeah I'm sure there will be photos of it at some point 
And uh, what else? It's also equipped with his own Fishman Custom uh, MKH Fluence Modern 3 voice pickup. So it comes with like killer, killer pickups for metal. And there was like all kinds of switching options that I completely forgot at this point. I, I watched this video and I think all of the four pots had a push pull feature. And if you know anything about uh, those uh, Fishman fl Fluence pickups, forgot the name of the brand for a second. Uh, <laughs> they got so many different switching options. And yeah, you are getting a lot of different sounds. And on the final note, I've listened to the Trivium's new album over the past week or so. It's actually good. Had, hadn't listened to the band for over a decade and all of a sudden I hear them again and it is good. Those guys can play and sing. Oh, oh yeah, they absolutely can. I remember when they first came out with the first record, which I can't remember the name of off the top of my head either. Was it Ascendancy? Was it Shogun? Oh, they had something like Shogun or something like that. Let me check you'll have to google that but yeah i remember when they came out and i remember seeing them in magazines like kerrang and metal hammer and i was just at some point someone put how old matt heafy was and he's younger than me <laughs> by a year or two i think and i was like oh my god this guy is he's so talented he you know an amazing songwriter yes. at such a young age a great player and some of the stuff that he plays while performing those intricate vocals yeah. is is pretty crazy. So he's he's always been a great musician and I think a big inspiration to a lot of players coming through. And of course, he's always had this thing with Epiphones and he's had a previous signature run of guitars, which were by all accounts, very, very good value for money. They sold out and now we have these new ones, which look fantastic again, although Matt doesn't look particularly happy in the image there. Perhaps he's <laughs> just thinking about dinner or something. I don't know, but could be. These should be, oh, in way. terms of value for money, in terms of what you get for that price, pretty, pretty decent guitars. Pro-level guitars, I would say. And indeed, yeah. he is a pro uh, who's playing them on stage. So, I actually have to mention also that uh, the neck joint on this guitar looks super comfortable. So it's not like a tra traditional bulky Les Paul uh, neck joint. It's like very nicely carved and you should have way better upper fret access, which makes sense uh, for metal guitar play. He's also like a killer lead play as well and yeah, does a lot of the so solos yeah. on the band's songs, so it just makes sense. Great. Yeah, exactly. Like, and it, it, yeah, go ahead. It's great that you know, Epiphone and also Gibson these days are making the the modern mm. Les Pauls that give metal players and people who want to get up to the 24th fret quickly easier access to do that. So it, it's a no-brainer that this guitar has that sculpted heel or cutaway or whatever you want to call it. I think these are going to yeah. do really, really well. Yeah. I was just trying to figure out where is the like fourth tuning peg on the seventh string, but like we are checking out the Guitar World article and I think there's like a video clip playing where you can see that the kind of upper side, when you hold the guitar in the lap, uh, the upper side of the headstock has four tuners and there's three on the other side. So that's how they space them out. And, oh, also, one another interesting thing to mention, all of these models have a lefty option, which is very rare. Also very cool. This is a case of an artist who clearly cares 100% about the instrument and about his personal use and enjoyment of it, but also the people who would buy it. And you know that Matt Heafy yeah. is obviously very much attuned to what his fans are into because he does a lot of online digital media, doesn't he? He streams, yeah. he's worked with YouTubers before. It's actually Jared Dines, isn't it, who's toured with Trivium and played a few shows with them mm. in the not too distant past. So th this is a guy yes. who's totally in tune with his audience and I applaud him. I'm applauding. Yep. You You just can't see it because I'm not in frame right now, but I am physically applauding <laughs> Matt Heafy. Your hands are just like us of the camera and you're applauding very actively. They're just kind of wobbling around underneath. Yeah. Yes. I was applauding. Doesn't Nothing look weird more. at all. No. <laughs> uh, from Epiphone's to Fender, Fender unveils the 
Ja kysytä Sonic Play it, sillä käästä so, and I kysytä Sonic Silly Shape, but made in Mexico. And it's, uh, as Ryan of 60 Cycle Hum pointed out in his thumbnail, it's cheaper now. And slightly less featured as the American made one, but this is an interesting move, I gotta say, because it's, I'll try to find the price as we speak, but it's not like that much cheaper. Uh, it's uh, one, uh, 1079 euros at Thoman as of shooting this video, and that's, I'm probably getting like Finnish prices for this, so in Europe. Uh, 1099, 1099 available which, immediately. Shipped to Finland. Which is an interesting price point. Um, yes. I've looked at the, you know, the forums that I read and they're mostly UK based. And in the UK, you can buy an, a new but B-stock American built acoustasonic guitar for about £300 more than this Mexican one. So... Whoa. They're quite close in terms of price points. It's going to be interesting to yeah. see what people make of them and if they perform anywhere near as well as the American ones. I don't think the fact that yeah. they have less tonal options will put people off. And I guess I the natural it. next step is going to be in six months' time, there'll be a Mexican version of the the Jazzmaster Acoustasonic as well. Oh, yes. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's uh, one, one seven 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 for the US-made one. The Exodusonic Telecaster, that is. So there's a 700 euro price difference. That's a lot, but it's not that much. I don't know. I mean, all the profits go to the same company at the end, so I don't know if that really matters, but it's a neat, it's interesting. I mean, I think it totally makes sense for them to build affordable versions of their more expensive instruments, but... yeah. I also feel like I mocked the Acoustasonic a little bit when it came out. And I don't want to make fun of this guitar either too much. My my question is still, who's buying these? I, I really would like to know for whom they're the most practical. I can totally imagine that if you're a, a live player and you're playing a set where you play acoustic and electric songs in the same set, if you want to have one instrument to do all of that, you could use one of these, but... I don't think it's the kind of guitar you'd sit with at home and just noodle sat on the couch, right? I mean, you had the Acoustasonic. What, what does it sound like, actually, acoustically? It's actually a perfect noodling guitar on the couch because oh, okay. there, there is the acoustic element, uh, but it's not as loud as that. Like, if I get my dredge on and sit on the couch, uh, no one around me will be happy because it's a big body guitar, it's loud. This isn't. Yeah. And the Jazzmaster version I had sustained really well and it was just a lot of fun to play and I kind of wish I could have kept it but I also need to feed the family so I wasn't able to but I mean I think like it's growing on me more and more like I lo like I, especially after having one I like the concept a lot and like Pairing acoustic guitar sounds with more like electric guitar style playability, at least. It's not like exactly the same as picking up my telly or anything else, but it's way closer. I really like that idea of it. And especially the Jazzmaster one was even more versatile sound wise than these are. So I think I'm guessing the next one they'll release will be the Strat, and then there will be the, the Jazzmaster then. Yeah. I mean, I definitely think that the fact that these are now, in terms of RRP, 700 euros cheaper than they were, mm. definitely makes the guitars more attractive to a, a whole new kind of budget point and group of people who would, you know, not want to pay 1700 but might consider this for around 1000 And you might see offers in stores selling these for 999 Who knows? At some point, yeah. once you get under that magic 1000 price point, they could be flying out the shops but again i i still mm. don't know anybody who owns one of these who wasn't a youtuber who was given one is anybody watching this who <laughs> owns an acoustasonic please let us know because we'd love to know your experiences or yeah, at least definitely. i would you've had one vlad of course uh, yes but i i think i'm a youtuber of some sort so 
Uh, it doesn't count. Oh, yeah, of course. Uh, interesting thing is that uh, I almost see this as an improvement because the Mexican-made one uh, runs on a 9-volt battery, mm-hmm. uh, whereas the American-made one had a rechargeable battery, uh, which was like my one of my only down points on it. Because if during the live set, like if you forget to recharge your rechargeable battery, which I think might have been swappable, but I don't know where you can get like a spare battery or anything like that. If you run out of battery during the show or just before the show starts, I, I'm not sure how you would deal with that. Maybe there was some solution I'm forgetting right now. But here you can have a bunch of 9-volt batteries with you and... So open a new one, you're good to go. So that might also actually be an improvement in some situations over the US made one. So Yeah, I would agree yeah. with that. And also like I don't I felt like uh, the Jazzmaster version had ten different sounds. So like a five way pickup switch and then there's the blend knob where you can blend between the two. I think these have six. And honestly Based on the ones they had with the telly, they picked exactly the ones that I would use anyway. So I think it just made so sense. Yeah, position one is a clean and fat Telecaster. And our friend Eric actually has a video out where he's putting that those sounds through like a big amp rig, which was really interesting. He got some cool, unique sounds. That way, uh, position two is lo-fi clean and crunch. And... Then there's a small body and red note acoustic. So you're getting the acoustic sounds, but some clean and crunch sounds as well. And yeah, I think it's cool. I'm again in like, I would also like to know who are the people buying this. And obviously these are selling well. Otherwise they wouldn't be releasing new models all the time. So that would be just bad, bad business, and I don't think Fender is doing bad business. So, yeah, I, yeah, they they must be selling. They must be doing well. Otherwise, as you say, there would be no point in doing another version, another model, a slightly different version. So, yeah, yeah. it's fascinating. Perhaps this is a model which is selling more in North America than Europe, and we're less kind of in tune to what's happening there. I'm sure this is Could a be. decent guitar for. Um, Worship players, right? Mm. It's kind of perfect for that, actually. Especially the Jazzmaster one. I played one set where I had just the guitar, nothing else. And then for some song, I could go because that one had a bridge humbucker and there was like a fairly drivey setting on it. I could just flip that one, do the lead thing, and then for the verse, quickly switch to a completely acoustic guitar sound and play that. It was kind of cool. So, yeah, it's perfect for that kind of stuff. And as yeah. we know, do you know when, like in US, yeah, the sales do you know in when US these are, are going to be like, available? Uh, did I just see that they were available right away? Available immediately. There you go. There you go. So, which color would it's you time choose? Time for you to make a trip to that local dealer and. You never know, they might have one of these, you'll get the pink PRS in. If you're very lucky, they'll have the Epiphone Billy Joe Armstrong Les Paul Jr. as well. You can try them all That's true. and report back and to it, us. Yeah, that list used to be a Gibson deal as well, so who knows, maybe they have those as well. Mm. Nice. A lot of cool, cool. stuff. That's, yeah, three very different but quite interesting instruments so far this week. Yeah, definitely. And speaking of uh, Telecaster-shaped guitars... Kiesel has unveiled their retro solo models, and these also look really cool. Yeah. Uh, to quote the Gear Cards article, Kiesel is taking a momentary break from making metal looking guitars and is venturing into the realm of Telecaster. And this is exactly <laughs> how they look like. Uh, I actually like yeah. the headstock shape quite a bit. Can you, you yeah, can see I mean, it in this photo, but in the video that's on the Gear channel, you can see the headstock shape. That's actually not bad. It's all right. I mean, for me personally, I measure everything against the original Fender 
or squire sure. headstock and that, and that's my favorite and and this is all right there are much worse telly and strat type headstocks out there so and there's only so <laughs> many different directions you can carve it you know so yeah. this looks all right i mean as you just mentioned this is a telly so it's not a metal shape but these guitars are built to play kiesel-esque that is metal mm. music aren't they if you look at the specifications you can tell that these are not really intended for people who are going to be playing classic telly twangy clean stuff too much yeah i'm uh, trying to remember what kind of my pickup is the Demon dark and sdr1 uh, let me quickly search for that because uh, i don't think that's a traditional pickup as you mentioned Although Some in the bridge, can... a Seymour Duncan Antiquity Tele Lead. Oh, it is actually a it's a vintage rhythm pickup for Tele. Oh, well, there you go. Uh, that proved me wrong. I was going by what the yeah. sentence underneath says, where it says, basically, if you want a very metal Telecaster, this should be your go-to. Interesting. Antiquity Tele Vintage Telecaster pickups. It's also... Yeah, yeah, designed to de deliver all the vibe and musicality of a vintage Telecaster pickup. That's the antiquity. Ah, well, there you go. So, it is a traditional sounding uh, Telecaster type guitar from Kiesel. So I guess the question that we have to ask ourselves now is, this guitar will cost $1,549. Who will buy it over a Fender Telecaster? It's going to be an interesting... Uh, choice for people in that regard i think because well there are so many different telecaster mm. models from other builders as well at that price point uh, i'm gonna say this is probably the telecaster for people who already own a kiesel and yeah. i also i'm also saying that because a lot of uh, metal guitar players when they venture into more vintage style instruments they usually go for telly because, like, if you come from a metal background, as I do, hello, uh, I think it's easiest to transition to telly. It's very different from your dual humbucker thing, but there's still, like, this kind of, I don't know, punchiness and power and everything we associate with telecasters. And, yeah, I, I'm guessing this will be, this could be a second perch, like, second keysel purchase after the, a lot of people have gotten their first like metal guitar from them then they will get this one and it just makes sense i mean i i know a lot of people are very kind of brand loyal to kiesel so just makes sense yeah and i suppose and the nice. other thing is if you're a kiesel player and you're at home with the kiesel neck you will probably oh, be at home true. with this because i'm assuming this is going to be a kiesel sort of very comfortable, modern-feeling neck profile mm. as opposed to being, you know, some massive old no-caster or a squire neck. So, yeah, exactly. It's probably going to be a very cool guitar. And, you know, there are many other makers, like I've just said, doing stuff that looks and sounds similar at similar price points, you know, from Fender to Sua to many, many others. But, yeah, Kiesel inspires quite a lot of brand loyalty, you're right. and th There have been a couple of Kiesel controversies over the past few years, but I believe that True. most of that has been and gone, I think. Apologies have been made, and I think a lot of people moved on. And so this is cool. Mm. The one problem with us for Kiesel is that there is nowhere for us to try these out, is the, except if we order them. And then when you order them, yeah. you've, you've got the guitar, haven't you? I'd love it if they opened yeah, that, some kind of a showroom over here. I wonder if they ever would consider doing that. I guess not, but yeah. that would be nice. Hard to tell. If, if their business is purely operated from US, like, yeah. it's not cheap to get one to Finland. Or like, it doesn't make sense because you probably can get something like that from a local luthier as well, some, somewhere over here for that money. Because the tax da does add up. In Finland, like it's immediately plus 24%. Then there's the import tax, like importing fees and all of that as well. So if it's uh, 1549 US dollars, uh, it's immediately uh, like times uh, 1.24 for me at least. So yeah, that's I would VAT say 
shipping and yeah. all of that. <clears throat> 2,000 euros minimum, I would suspect, for someone in Europe who's going to be ordering yeah, one of these. Much. Of course, the solution is for someone like you or me who's going to the NAM show, fingers crossed, if the <laughs> NAM show happens in June, get one of these, take it back on the plane and hope that nothing happens. Not that I'm exactly. condoning any illegal actions or anyone, you know, trying to not pay taxes on instruments that they've purchased. Let me just say that I know that there's people who have done this before and there will be people who'll do this in future too. But yeah, that would be one way of doing it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely. I mean, at the very but least, I mean, we'll get to try these at the NAMM show, so that's cool. Yes, let's hope that actually happens. From Kiesel's to... Catalin Bread, I've never understood the name of this company. Catalin Bread's new clock pedal both reverberates and shimmers. We're checking out the Gigard's article. Yeah, it's a reverb and shimmer pedal. There's a lot of these around. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> so so I, I don't mean to be like uh, negative or pessimistic or anything like that, but I'm having a hard time to tell this apart now. All have cool graphics, yeah. all are shimmering and reverberating, and that's cool. But I don't remember which thing. pedal is which anymore. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. I I really like the look of this pedal. I've watched the video which Vlad is hovering over right now, which features our good friend Jay Leonard J doing his thing with the cloak. And of course, he makes it sound amazing because he basically makes everything sound amazing. But yes, the, the slightly <laughs> the slightly unique thing about the cloak is that. It's a single pedal, so you've got just the one control, but you can kind of, you have a room style reverb and shimmer at the same time. So you, you start with the room reverb and then you kind of blend in the shimmer as you want it over the room. And so as they say in the text here, um, the size of the room can be dialed in from anywhere between a small closet to the vastness of space itself within reason, <laughs> which is a very interesting description. And then, you know, you can stick some shimmer on there as well to get some beautiful harmonically laden overtones as it's described here so everybody knows what shimmer reverb is now it's become yes. a common thing uh, again something beloved in the worship community and this is a pedal that mm. you will test alongside the the five six seven eight ten twenty other pedals that do this at the moment before you make your choice yeah that's true but i mean if it reverberates with you, then that's the bell they go with. That was a very bad joke I tried to make. That was a, that was a <laughs> pretty poor me. pun, yeah. How yes. many weeks have you been Please waiting to tell that joke? Um, not too many, but it it's just the car new, the broken car news broke me, if that makes any <laughs> sense. I'm not up to the regular speed right now. My mind yeah, is understandable. slightly else. Understandable. <laughs> well, full full more marks for trying to be funny, at least. That's good. Thank you. Much appreciated. And yeah. before we head to Joyo Band Amp uh, Media and Tweety stuff, a word from our sponsor, though. Again, we are the sponsor, I guess. Something like that. You can become a good songwriter, but in order to get there, there's something you need to do. Write a lot of songs. Songwriting is often portrayed as something that only people with special talent can do. But in reality, it's as most things in life. The more you do it, the better you'll get at it. However, finishing a first song can be a challenge. And even if you manage to write your first song, doing that on a consistent basis is hard. That's where Get Songs Done can help you. Get Songs Done is a songwriting course that teaches you new, structured songwriting method that guarantees you will finish your song every time. Get Songs Done was born from a real-life situation of having a family and a day job but still wanting to write and release songs. The songwriting method makes sure that whether you have 30 minutes or 3 hours at your disposal, you'll always know what to do next. I am not telling you what to write, but I am showing you how to structure a songwriting process so you can actually finish the song. We'll go from different ways of coming up with song ideas to creating a rough song structure, arranging your ideas into a well-flowing song and adding those sweetening details to make it sound exciting and professional. During the course, I will put everything I teach into practice and write a song from scratch using the Get Songs Done method to demonstrate each step of the songwriting process. 
And because most of us are not multi-instrumentalists, I will teach you how to work with other musicians, how to do that remotely, and how to make those sessions fun and productive. There's two versions of the course, the standard and VIP. The VIP version has everything that the standard version has, but you also get to submit your song for me to review. I will capture my initial reactions to your song and my in-depth feedback to help you get even better at songwriting. So basically, you'll get your personalized Vlad Reacts video and some encouraging feedback to help you grow as a songwriter. And until the end of 2021, Cat Pick Friday's listeners can get a special 40% discount on either versions of the course by using the code 2021 upon checkout. Oh, and did I mention? The course comes with a full 30-day money-back guarantee, no questions asked. So sign up today and we will get songs done. Sorry, the joke was... It was right there, I had to. And we're back. Let's jump to Joyo Band Amp Series adds a Emilio 2 and Tweedy Amps into its Band Amp lineup. And I have personal experience with most Joyo Band Amps. Uh, we shot a fun video with, I think it was with Colin in 2017 and the first GitCon. We were so young and beautiful that time. And uh, no way less young, yes. but maybe even more beautiful. What? Uh, this is a cool, cool, cool amp range. And I think the version twos of these all have two different channels with dedicated controls, unless I'm mistaken. And for the one that they're asking, these sound amazing. I have a Joyo Media amp demo on my channel, maybe even more than one demo that is and for the money it sounds amazing and it's super tiny it's compact i think you can uh, use the line out and you don't have to plug in a cabinet and you can record with it and stuff like that it's great and at 20 watts it's pretty damn loud if you put it through a cabinet so yeah cool little release yeah, these look cool. I remember your original videos with some of these, and I assume that these are even better, these Mark IIs. Yeah. There is no retail price given on the article that we're looking at, but they're probably going to be, what, true. 150 euros, 200 tops? So very, very like affordable amplifiers. And as yep. you say, they're two-channel. They have a clean and a dirty channel with separate controls for each. So that's kind of cool. You know, you see much bigger, more expensive amps that share controls between one or two or three channels. And I personally yeah. always prefer having individual control of, let's say, the, the EQ stack for each channel. So this is, this is kind of mm. nice. Where would you put these in terms of kind of how modern or how vintage they sound? And what kind of distortion can people expect from them? Well, the... Uh, Meteor, they're not too subtle about it. Uh, let's see if I can zoom this photo. Uh, yeah, I can. So <laughs> if we're looking at the Meteor and it says MIDI or, or like O and R and number, like the Roman numeral two are highlighted and this, like they're not hiding the fact that this goes for the orange sound and uh, it's close-ish ah. to the orange rockaverb sound. It goes for that okay. sound, and it works really well. Like, so, And I actually, like, one of my most popular videos on the channel is me comparing the orange, uh, is it Tiny Terror? Like the smallest. Tiny Terror? Yes, yeah, the, the or, Tiny Terror. Yeah, comparing that to this and... Like it's it's a bit more modern because the rock verb sound is a bit more modern than like the uh, I, I, well I'm not sure maybe they're going for the different channels of the amp or something like that but like uh, the Joyo Media is a bit more high gain a bit more modern but there's definitely like an orange flavor to it and yeah two channels makes it even more versatile so well done. 
Cool. And oh, what yeah, about the Tweedy? That. I mean, I'm just, guessing. Uh, yeah, I'm guessing the Tweedy is a, a Fender amp. Yes, they kind of allude to that. <laughs> American classic vintage tone. So, yeah, and for, uh, with the media, they say like the distortion side of amp has a little bit of fuzz. Yes, which is kind of an orange thing as well. Yeah, this is a good, good range of amps. Very loud. I remember, like, even Phil X being impressed by these at that event. I think I switched yeah. one of the videos where he was trying this out. Has Bluetooth connection as well, so you can stream your backing tracks into it and stuff like that. So, yeah, very really? nice. I think oh. that this area of the amplifier market, these small compact heads that are you know, not pocket change, but cost between 100 and 250, 300 euros or dollars is really, really good right now. There's so many choices for people who want to do this. I mean, we've recently seen the mini amps from, you know, the boutique amp distribution company. So we've got JoJo's yeah. on the one hand, we've got the Friedman Mini BE, if you want to go a bit more boutique in that range, and we've got the the Bogner and the Dietzel as well, and more to come from them. You've got JoJo, you've got other brands like Hughes and Kettner who do smaller amps, you've got the Orange, Tiny Terra, there's so many of them. So I think pretty much no matter what kind of guitar player you are these days, you've got a mini head that you can use. And they're very practical, aren't they? Like you said, I mean, they're super yep. loud. I mean, 20 watts is going to be loud enough for most things. You probably wouldn't want to really rely on it to play a gig with especially if you are playing with a loud drummer. But if it can be plugged directly mm. into the PA as well, then no issues there whatsoever. Very, very cool. And it's kind of the situation where I can imagine people starting to build up collections of small amplifiers as they would have done mm. with pedals in the old days. Yeah. You know, if you want that Friedman BE sound, for example, instead of buying that pedal, you can buy a full mm. mini-sized BE amp head. Mm. And if you want, which actually, yeah, mm. which might actually bring you closer to that, like the kind of real amp version sound, than a pedal, depending on what your amp you're using, for example. So, yeah, that's yeah. that's the other question, of course. But these just, it's such a great way of dipping your toe into another kind of genre, if that's what you want to do. If you are, for example, interested in going for the the orange rocker verb, and you mm. wanted to test it out in a way, and if this meteor is modeled on that, you can test one of those out. And if that works for you, consider going for the full size rocker verb. Yep. Pretty much. Uh, yeah, we're checking out the Thorman website and like there's two, at least two Mark II versions of this amp. So the Joyo Zombie, which is Mesa Boogie, just saying. And then there was a the Jackman, okay. which I think went for something else that I'm forgetting right now. But yeah, basically like 149 euros. That's cheaper than most of the pedals out there. Like high quality, high gain drive. So yeah, these are cool solid option. state, yeah. but analog amps, right? They're not yes. modelers, I yes. assume. Yeah, not mo not modeling solid state, but um, yeah, and analog. Cool little amps. Hopefully, I get to try this out somewhere at some point. And jumping to the next topic from gear to music <laughs> which that sounds thing like that we I'm, buy all the gear for finally someone's uh, yes, actually making exactly music that, with it yes exactly that was ki kind of the point I was trying to make without actually being able to make it uh, Jared uh, Dines no, you're just and Howard Jones announced than me. debut sorry what no I'm just saying you were being a little bit more subtle than me in how you said it so well done yes uh, I yeah I'm not up to speed today, as I've mentioned a couple of times already. But yeah, Jared Dines and Howard Jones announced a debut album as Zion. And this is interesting because um, Jared Dines is obviously a huge, huge YouTuber in an art guitar space. Two point something million subscribers and very influential. And then Howard Jones uh, is... A singer, is he an ex singer now of the band that we both grew up loving? So, this is kind of cool. So, yeah, I'm guessing that yeah, Jared Dines of, also grew up idolizing them, and now he gets to yeah. make a record with, with Howard Jones, the singer from one of his favorite bands. 
And Howard Jones is yeah, an that... incredible vocalist. Like he's a great yeah. singer and his scream is one of my personal favorites. I think it's one of the best. He's such a versatile mm. vocalist, such a strong voice, such a massive yeah. set of lungs as well. <laughs> yes. Not indeed. that I've seen his lungs. I just assume they're gigantic. <laughs> In fact, I once remember reading an article about them where the guy wrote lungs like cricket bats. And that's always stuck with me, just imagining that he has these two humongous lungs that just fill his abdomen. But based on how he sings and the notes that he puts out and holds, it's entirely possible, I would say. I am not a scientist, but it's entirely possible. Yes, definitely. But I mean, yeah, it, it, it's kind of cool. Like, they have few singles out at this point, uh, more than just myself. And there was another one that's not in this Guitar World article, but that I also checked out. And uh, yeah, Howard Jones definitely still has it. Jerry Dines is obviously a good guitar player, or like a great guitar player as well. But I think we talked about before starting shooting the show that he played with Trivium at some point, I think. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, pretty so, cool for him. Oh, yes. Yes, and the cool thing about this is, like, Jared has a proper audience. Like, he has a huge audience already. So, them doing, like, proper music, if I dare to say, like, albums and stuff, I think it's cool because it will get listeners and maybe a lot of new people will get introduced to Howard Jones's vocals as well because... Yeah, yeah, it definitely brought me back listening to this uh, or like these two singles, and like especially when we went to choruses, and there was that very, very unique and very recognizable like singing. It's it's like somewhere between like shouting and singing that he does. He kind of slings himself into a note, and it's very cool. Like, I I could very quickly recognize his voice is he if he he would feature on like someone else's song or something like that it's very recognizable yeah, exactly. that's, that's cool yeah that's the mark of quite a few great singers who might not always be Indeed. the best technical singers but if you recognize their mm. voice instantly then that's that's always a cool thing isn't it for a, for a musician yeah. and his is one of those voices that i also automatically recognize straight away i haven't heard any of these scion songs mm. what are they like is it like the kind of music that jared plays on his channel crossed with the vocal style that we would know how it jones for mm, maybe i'm not sure like i don't have any impression of like what jared is actually playing like what his playing style is but it, uh, to me it was like a bit more modern riffs than what uh, kill switch engage was when howard was part of the band but then yeah. the choruses were very kill switch engage, which I personally like. So okay, cool. Yeah, modern, I mean personally, I but it, it's actually funny what you say about Jared because he's a very very versatile player. You know, he does a lot of different true. things and a lot of different funny skits on his channel too. And of course, he's a great drummer as well. But I guess yeah. I would associate him most with Gent music mm. you know that's what some of his biggest videos are where he brings together the top gent players and they do a, a massive collaboration track together so if he's mm. blending sort of genty riffs with howard jones's style of singing i'm quite interested to hear how that's going to work i mean is it going to sound mm. something like periphery I, i'm not sure but i'm going to have to give this a listen after we finish doing yeah. the show yeah to me that definitely didn't sound like periphery but uh Definitely a bit more modern than Kill Switch Engage, which makes sense, like yeah. because my impressions of Howard Jones are from 2006, so what 15 years ago? Wow! Uh, so maybe I need to update my <laughs> impression of what what a modern metal sounds like. But yeah, same for me, sound, Sounds good. I I'll definitely be checking out the album just because of Howard's vocals alone. And yeah, for me too. Yeah. The, the one interesting question for me about this record is, do you think that people will take it seriously from both sides? I mean, firstly, you have Jared, who is stepping into making what is a proper serious record with a professional musician. And on the other hand, mm -hmm. you have Howard Jones, who is a, you know, 
pretty much a super a super star, a superstar super in the metalcore star. industry, or was for a while. You know, a, a hugely yeah. well regarded vocalist, and now he's doing an album with a YouTuber. So you've got these two connected, but also different worlds coming together. Do you think people will take this seriously, or do you think people will more see it as kind of like just a project between two friends? It's uh, it's hard. Tell, I feel like there's been a lot of YouTubers who are trying to start their own solo projects, uh, either alone or like with some other artists. Uh, I don't know. Based on the two singles I heard, this sounds legit enough to me that it could be taken as like a real band, if you will. Um, yeah. Like a real project. And yeah, it's kind of Jared's uh, kind of influential power on YouTube paired with the fact that it, Howard is kind of a legendary singer of that one band. I think that could work. That could actually work. And yeah, interested. Like, I don't think the article mentions that they have any plans to take this live or anything like that, but we'll see. This is interesting. Ah, if you, There's been few. Yeah. If you scroll so, down again to the very bottom of the article, look at that. Look at that line there above that image. The origins of the band date reportedly back to Dines and Jones's involvement as guest guitarist and support, respectively, on Trivium's 2018 tour. So there you go. That's where they would have mm. kind of sort of sown the seed for this collaboration. So that's yeah. that's pretty cool. Yeah, and the thing I was that, like, I was impressed with was the fact that these songs actually sounded very decent. So like, actually like good songs. That that that's where I feel it fails sometimes. I don't want to bash him too much, but like, uh, you know who Anthony Vincent is, the ten second song guy. I know the ten the second songs channel. He, he's I also a gigantic name. channel. And yeah. he, he's amazing at imitating like all kinds of singers and music styles. Yeah, yeah. But all of the solo material he has released hasn't really worked for me. It 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 felt like okay, this is this is an incredibly talented guy that needs to be paired with like an amazing songwriter to get most out of that collaboration. This felt more like. Like they have something going on. I'm basing yeah, all this by two songs. Maybe the rest of the album <laughs> is complete garbage, or it could be actually good. So <laughs> we yeah, shall see. I'll, I'll be interested to hear it because Jared's done solo stuff before, but mm. it was good. It was decently made, you know, well produced and played and everything. But I don't know if yep. he ever went beyond the Jared Dines fan base with it. And what he yep. will be doing with Howard Jones is opening them up to, you know, this crowd of people who like Howard Jones so it's going to be really interesting yeah. to see how they take to it I guess another discussion yeah. that we can have in a future episode is the idea that lots of people who play guitar on YouTube would really like to be in bands but hardly mm. any of them have made a successful crossover into becoming respected artists in fact yeah. you could probably count the number on one hand who have so that's yeah write that down in the episode yeah. list and we'll talk about that at some point yeah, definitely. Yeah, the only one I can think of right away is Leo, which is interesting. Like he's not writing the songs, but he's been incredibly successful turning that into a live show. Okay, I'm talking about artistry in the sense of also writing okay, the material. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're 100 percent correct that Frog Leap is a huge and hugely fun live thing. They they've headlined mm. festivals, so they're they're totally doing yeah. it, but. In terms of people who've written tracks, you know, stuff that has come from them. Yeah, that's and of a course, good point. the production that he does on the pop songs, he changes them so much that you could basically say that he's writing tunes, you know, but the, the melodies and lyrics yeah, are already uh, there. So, yeah, slightly yeah. different thing. Yeah. But yeah. Something for us to maybe discuss at some point in the future. Maybe get Leo on. Yeah, the, I don't know if he'd want to do that, but <laughs> who knows? Maybe he will. Uh, I think this is so interesting. Like uh, we talked about Matt Heafy earlier in the show. Like this, like they are kind of at same 
point in a way, but uh, from different, like, they started from different sides. Matt started from, like, purely bad, band perspective and then became a huge online presence. Uh, Jared started as, like, a huge online presence and now he's kind of diving into the band thing more and more. So that's kind of interesting. Would be awesome to get both of them on the show to talk about this. Maybe one day. Uh, sure, let me let me give them a call as I have them both on speed dial. Oh wait, I should talk to them daily. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, if we've got the budget, they'll come on. I happen to know that That's this true. will not be something that we'll get for free. So there you go. Yeah. So if people, if enough of you lovely people buy the songwriting course, links in the show notes. We'll get these guys on. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Stupid jokes aside, it is my time to pick the... Oh, come on. Albums of our lives pick. And, spoiler, it actually relates to what we just talked. So let's dive in there right away. Like plastic on a CD shelf, these are the albums of our lives. And what I meant by what I just said is that my album pick for albums of our lives, lies, <laughs> albums of our lives. <laughs> That's a different segment in the show that we'll introduce at some other point. We'll tell, yeah. Uh, albums of our lives, Kill Switch Engage, As Daylight Dies. I know everyone loves, is it, uh, what's the name the of, of that take. album? End of her, yeah, end of a heartache, right? The previous album, yep. yep. So, I know for a lot of people, that's the Kill Switch Engage album. For me, it's this one. Uh, I think I got introduced to the band through Guitar Hero, actually. So, this album came out in 2006, oh, yeah. and I remember. I'm going to say it was Guitar Hero 3, maybe. And I remember me and my brother playing that a lot. I was actually playing way more Guitar Hero than I was playing the actual guitar. Well done, me. And yeah, this album blew my mind. Like, from... Uh, my Curse was probably the first signal I heard, and it was amazing. Like, it's it's a very simple song, but Howard Jones's vocals, those heavy riffs, and all the things in this album. Like, I'm, I'm going to say this album and the previous one, the uh, End of Heartache, have probably influenced a countless amount of bands because watching Trey's uh, live streams, the songwriting contest live streams where people submit their songs, and also like the Song Critic live streams, there is so many bands there and artists there that sound like Switch Engage, but especially the riffs and the way they structure their choruses and stuff like that, it sounds like Kill Switch Engaged. And yeah, yeah. So, what was One it about my... As Daylight Dies that you prefer over the classic? Because I think, you know, The End of Heartache <laughs> is my Kill Switch Engage album as well. And I think that that's the one yeah. that most people would say is the Kill Switch record. What is it about As Daylight Dies that for you is is better? Is it just that it arrived uh, at a more important time in your life or something where it was more kind of inspirational to you? Or is the do, do you think the songs are better or the production? Uh, I think it comes down to the fact that this was the one, the first one I heard. <laughs> Simple as that, really. Yeah, that, that's often uh, I've the way to both it is. Of yep. them. Yeah, because... Uh, this is the first one I heard, and this is the one I fell in love with. And then I started to check uh, what else they had been doing. And th it's, it's probably like that nostalgia thing, like, because I really like this so much, I just went with it and, like, really, really dissected the whole album and listened to it countless of times. And, yeah, I, like, looking at the track listing... Uh, pretty much remember every single song from this album like not the special edition bonus track version though I think I've listened to that one as well but like I, I 
can almost like remember all the choruses from it and all of that. It's just that this was the album I heard first, and because we weren't living in the Spotify and Apple Music era at that time yet, uh, this was the only album I had access to. I think I might have had a physical version of this, but I'm not 100% sure. So I might have downloaded the album, not so legally at the time. Please forgive me. Confession time. You're forgiven. Thank you. But yeah, it's it's just that like uh even going back to end of or like going then going to end of heartache, like I think that album have some of the songs are better than on this one, but it's just like it's such a monumental thing in my teens that it's I j- yeah. There's nothing I can do about it anymore. It's kind of engraved somewhere in my musical ID and it's there. Yeah, that's the thing. We've talked about it quite a lot on this segment before, but there is that really important time in your life, you know, when you go through adolescence from maybe early teens, maybe a bit younger through to maybe early 20s or something where I think your musical taste is kind of confirmed and sort of burned into you. And everything you hear afterwards is kind of measured up against that. And it is true what you said about the first record that you hear by a band that you fall in love with. That's also often the one that you will cite as your favorite, no matter how that is kind of regarded compared to the rest of the band's output. I mean, As Daylight Dies is a great record as well. But for me personally, it would be the end of Heartache. But there's a lot of other bands that I've heard where I've heard a different record to my friends first. And I'm saying, yeah, Mm. this record is the best. And they're saying that one's the best. And it's just the one that got into your brain quicker and just sort of stuck itself, lodged itself fast in your long-term musical memory. You know, that's the way it is. Yeah, exactly. It's a very good choice of album. So I approve with two thumbs up. Which yes. is a system you we approval? haven't used in ages. Yes. Do I, do I need your approval? Uh, I'm going to reply with another Catpick Studios classic, Unlikely. Uh, but Ugh. yeah. Uh, oh, uh, yeah. I have to mention, like, speaking of that, like, how it was like. Uh, yeah. The things that kind of relate, like, there's so many things that come together. Like, in 2016, I turned, or 2006, I turned 18. So that may, meant that I got my driver's license. Actually, I got my driver's license on the day I turned 18 and I owned a car at that point. And I obviously installed like a CD player that could uh, play like those uh, burnt CDs where you would have like folders of albums. And this was one of the albums on the first CD I burned for that car. So I would drive around in my uh, not so new Honda Civic and listen to this album. And, because, yeah. you know, like all of those things kind of go together. And like, even though maybe End of Heartache is a better album, this just brings me back to good old days. And we're yeah, all this about is, nostalgia at this point. Yeah, this is the so. album of your life. This is not necessarily Ind- objectively the best Killswitch Engage album. So... It's a legitimate choice. Well, any album that we pick yep. for this is a legitimate choice, unless it is the album of our lie, and we try and get cool points by <laughs> selecting a classic record that we don't actually listen to. Indeed. Which I haven't done so far. I mean, why else would I have chosen Less Than Jake to try and get cool points? There's nothing cool about Scar yeah. Punk. That but was Death a fun Scar. album, by the way. I listened to it a couple of times. I really enjoyed it. And actually, my daughter. Oh, it's an amazing it well. album. It's, it's yeah, it's a f- fast, energetic music. She liked it as well. So, thank you. Perfect for perfect for kids. That's for sure. If you want to get your kids dancing, don't play them Kill Switch Engage. Play them Less Than Jake. That, yeah, that that's probably true. Yeah. So, but yeah, one of my favorite albums. Uh, I guess the only thing is like I don't come back to it that much anymore, just because. I know like every single riff and every single vocal line and everything from this album so well yeah. that it, yeah, I kind of don't feel like listening to it, but you never know. 
And one, yeah, one of these days, mean. I kind of hope uh, I'll actually like do a cover of one of these songs just to feel nostalgic again. Yeah. By the way, just looking at the the page that we're looking at, this album was released on Roadrunner Records, and I'm sure everyone mm. watching or listening to this is familiar with Roadrunner. It has been one of the biggest metal independent labels for quite a long time. I don't know if it's still an independent label, but it was back then. Do you remember, Vlad, that Roadrunner did a series of compilation albums where they would get artists together from bands mm. on the label and they would do songs as groups? Roadrunner oh, United, wow. I think it was called. So you get like guys from Trivium and Killswitch and Machine Head all doing songs together. That was a really strange time and resulted in some very <laughs> interesting but actually not that great collaborations. <laughs> So that's uh, yeah, not going to be an album that. of my life, but it just I was just reminded of it from this. And also yeah. from the fact that we've I, talked I about collaborations that. earlier. I'm going to have to Google yeah. that as well. Uh, what do you think of the Holy Diver cover that's on the special edition of the album? Oh, I think Howard Jones is doing a really, really good job. Holy Diver is like one yeah. of those songs where it's almost sacrilege to do a cover of it because it's Dio, but... If I yeah. was going to have anyone doing a contemporary version of it, I would choose Howard Jones to do it because mm. he just sounds so, he sounds so huge. You know, Dio was yeah. actually tiny, like a minuscule man. Yes. I, and yeah, he had this I, massive I voice. Well, for me, Howard Jones can kind of, you know, he doesn't sound the same. He's not trying to sound the same, but he, he brings that similar energy to it for me. So mm. for me, it worked. I have to admit, like at this time when this came out, I actually hadn't, uh, I didn't know about Dio that much at that point. I didn't know Holy Dive was his song. And obviously I then went and listened to Dio, like the original one, but this was the first Holy Diver version I heard. So you can imagine my uh, reaction when I heard the original one. They're a bit different, a bit less heavy, a bit slower. Yeah. Uh, but... Yeah, Dio's voice is still amazing. Like, if he would come up as an artist now, he would still be like incredibly well known, just because his voice was so, so unique and so powerful. But that's a have you seen the day, I guess. Yeah, maybe we've even talked about it because I'm getting deja vu just talking about this with you now. But have you seen that mm. Dio is now performing live again as a hologram? Oh, I haven't that. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that I don't know. That's an interesting case, isn't it? Yeah, we're we're like hell bent on nostalgia right now. I I don't know where it's coming from. Like, can't we have new nice things? Do we always need to go back to the old ones? Again, a discussion for a different time and different episode. Yep. <laughs> Questions and comments. All right. Time to dive into your questions and comments, and we'll start with this one. And come on, why do I always forget to prepare the qu comments in a way where I could actually like quickly read them? Well done, Vlad. I'm very professional. Nick B, on was it the previous episode we did? Well, a couple of episodes ago. I think it was ago, the previous, 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 previous. Yes, it's the previous, previous. Uh, Nick says that. Uh, I'm on the waiting list to get the King of Tone, but I'll definitely pick up the Joyo copy. We were talking about the Joyo King of Kings and wondering whether it will sound like the original King of Tone, and the answer was unlikely. And yeah, he's saying that the Joyo R series are seriously good pedals. I have full confidence that Joyo has made a quality homage to the King of Tone. First of all, Nick, thank you. For letting us know. This is very interesting to hear for some, from someone who's actually on the waiting list and still thinks they want to pick up a king, not king of stone, king, king of kings. So many kings here. I get confused. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I totally get that. I mean, you mentioned that the waiting list is like four years, so might as well have something like that in while waiting. Makes sense to me. Yeah. If you really want that pedal, as I do, I'm also on the list. Don't forget. I think next year is when I'll get to the top of the list. But yeah, imagine Ooh. if you've still got three and a half years to wait. 
and you really want that king of tone sound and the king of kings comes out it's it's kind of a no brainer I mean, we yep. still don't know exactly how much the Joyo is going to cost. And I literally just searched it as you mm. were reading the question. And it doesn't seem to be available anywhere yet either. So we're still waiting to hear final pricing and availability on that. But it's it's definitely going to fill that hole until you get the real King of Tone. Of course, you know, mm. there's plenty of other pedals out there that do the King of Tone sort of sounds with similarly distinct names that mention royal people in them. But yeah. The Joe UR series is a good series. They they make decent pedals. So I agree with Nick in that I have full confidence that this is going to be a decent homage. Yep. Yeah. By the uh, way, are, are you familiar with the the line I agree with Nick? Uh unfortunately Does not. Does that ring any bells for you? Okay. Uh, it's a I'm British not politics not. thing from a few years ago. Uh, so if anyone watching this is interesting in UK politics and your ears pricked Cruising. up when I said that line, let's let's never speak of it again. Okay, got it, got it. But yeah, thank you, Nick. Appreciate it. Uh, question number two, or comment number two comes from our friend Alexis Pelli, who, com- who was actually the one who asked, uh, whether we like what our favorite black metal bands, and uh, we gave him a really comprehensive non answer <laughs> because we're not really black metal experts. And Alexei is, is commenting, guys, so happy you <laughs> that you included my question and great answers. Thank you. Uh, like watching Immortal, I had nice laugh yet big appreciation for your dedication. <laughs> I, I love the fact that somebody appreciates that we at least tried so thank you (laughs) yeah like we said previously in the episode about something else full marks for trying i mean yeah it's it's cool to get questions like this that knock us out of our comfort zones if we were just doing the same old boring stuff every week it would be a boring exercise wouldn't it but yes now at some point we're gonna have to listen to some black metal so thank you again alexis for forcing us out of our comfort zones and making me come up with yeah. the death scar genre over the past seven days. <laughs> Have you started writing the album already? No, I've done nothing. Ah. I've just come up with the genre, but I feel like I'm still a pioneer in that respect because I have my genre and I just need to start filling it up now. That's that's the way it is. That is true. You have the yep. moral or some sort of like upper hand in this. Like I came up with it. We have video proof of that. Yeah, exactly. Cool. If anyone ever comes up with a Death Scar band, which they probably already have, by the way, I just came up with that yeah, off be. the cuff this morning. But it, if there is a Death Scar band, it's you owe me twenty percent of whatever you earned. Cool. Let's roll with that one. And the third question and comment was from, please forgive me, uh, Dale Palmer on a live stream that I actually did yesterday, which would have been Wednesday, 17th, November 21, 2021. Uh, and he just said that, I enjoy seeing your song creation and recording process. And thank you, Dale. That is very much appreciated. Uh, yesterday, I, or for you guys who are watching on Friday, so on Wednesday, I did a live stream where I actually pick up to one of my songs that I had kind of written for the boss video we did uh, for titled How to Sound Like Synthwave on a Guitar. So I picked, like, I really like how that song turned out. Oh, we lost Rich for a second. Uh, yeah, I really liked how that song turned out, but uh, it wasn't like a complete song. There was like a guitar solo on top of it and stuff like that. And I wanted to... Hello, you're back. Welcome. I, I don't know what happened. But I'm back. Well, Did I miss anything important? Yes. Uh, I'll, I'll have to rewatch. N- n- nothing else than I just mentioned that uh, I basically picked it up picked up a song that I had kind of already written or like it's a, like a 50 second instrumental and now I'm working it into a real song and on that live stream me and it's, uh, with a bit of help from Poor Ninja we came up with some dummy lyrics for that song or at least the chorus and we actually came up with a story 
for that song as well. And the song will be about uh, it will be a story like I was driving, like I met you somewhere. We were driving around the city in the night, and then we went to a nightclub, and you were the only one out of us two who was let in, and I never saw you again. That's the story of the song that we're writing over there. I think that's a good synth wave story to tell in that very that synth wave song. Sounds nice. So. Starts out like a Bruce Springsteen song, ends up like <laughs> something else. <laughs> something else indeed. Uh, but yeah, uh, in that stream, I do like I took the elements I had from the instrumental version of that song and kind of took them further. Started to add like dummy vocals and arranging it a little bit. And I will continue that project most likely next week. So. so yeah, I plan to do the whole song live. Maybe mine is the mixing part, which will be very boring to follow if I sit there for three hours just mixing the song. I don't know if anyone will enjoy that. But otherwise, I plan to do all of the things live. And this was first time for me singing, like recording vocals live. While people ah, were Ah, you were watching. singing on that the was... live stream. Yes, I was singing on the live stream. By the way, it took me like two weeks to figure out all the technicalities, how to make it work, to have like kind of triple camera setup and all of that. But it worked, and I'm happy. So Very interesting. Well, I, I definitely yeah. agree with Dale, and I agree with Nick. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to have to explain <laughs> that in a second. I agree with Dale because I feel that kind of going behind that song creation and also the recording process can be extremely useful for people who are not 100% confident with how to do it themselves. And I feel like you can have that explained to you a hundred times. And of course it would be easiest to be doing it yourself and have, you know, like a songwriting recording master with you to help you out. But to actually watch you going through it is definitely going to be really helpful. And I also really enjoy watching videos like that. I recently also watched a similar video this week by a guy called Jim Lil, who is an amazing American mm. session guitar player who very sporadically releases videos on YouTube, but he's a great kind of country and rock guitar player and performer, composer, session musician, uh, sideman guitar player. And he did a video where he he didn't write a song, but he went through the whole recording, mixing and mastering process for just a country song, mm. the, the son of a son of a sailor man or something. This, this song was called, it was one that I didn't know, <laughs> but he, you just have a live stream of him in his room. He plays the drums, he plays the bass, he plays the guitar, he does the lap steel, he does the, the vocals and the harmonies. He does the other instrumentation, whatever it was being country. Mm. There was probably a banjo or a mandolin in it. I can't remember, but then he quickly mixes it as well and masters it, tells us all what he's doing at every step of the way. And it was just really, really useful. There are just little tricks that you get to learn. It's things that become common sense once you've done them or once you learn mm. from someone more experienced. And it's just something that I think could help improve everyone who watches it. So again, Dale, I hope you learned a lot and I hope it helps you in your future song creation and your recording processes and you end up with writing and producing better songs in future. And yep. because everybody is asking, I can tell... I agree with Nick, was a political story in the UK. There was going to be an election coming up. It was David Cameron for the Conservatives and Gordon Brown for the Labour Party, the two big parties. The third party in the UK is the Liberal Democrats, and they had a leader who was called Nick Clegg, who is actually now one of the highest people at Facebook. So you've probably heard of Nick Clegg through his Facebook stuff. But anyway, they had a live TV debate, and... They'd ask the the three leaders of the three parties questions and you'd hear David Cameron say something, you'd hear Gordon Brown something and you'd hear Nick Clegg something. And how this TV debate went was that Nick Clegg would say something and then the other two would both say, I agree with Nick. And everyone left that debate <laughs> with Nick Clegg winning because the other two just agreed with everything that he said. And it ended up being that the UK entered its first ever coalition government. No, not its first ever, but its first coalition government in many, many decades with Nick Clegg being deputy prime minister to David Cameron's prime minister. So that's what mm. I agree with Nick is. UK politics done. Let's move on. And apologies for the last 30 seconds. <laughs> no, it's good. I, le I learned a new thing or two. So 
Yeah, you Thank can you. entertain people at parties for years to come with that anecdote. Absolutely. Or I might forget it in five minutes as, after we've done. Uh, I've already. Here. It's gone. Who's Nick again? It's gone. Yes. Uh, that live stream thing I just mentioned, it's up on the channel. Uh, weirdly enough, I haven't been able to delete the first few seconds, like um, the first minute of that stream because I had my audio accidentally muted. And somehow YouTube's editor is kind of broken right now. I just cannot mm. like cut out the first minute, so I had to add like a comment there. So, oh well, I will figure it out later. And yeah, it's a fun watch. And yes, yeah, stay tuned for the next episode, most likely next week. I don't think I'll be doing one tomorrow, and I try to have weekends off. So, yeah. I'm excited to see where the song goes from here. And Rich, I might invite you for a lyric writing session as well, because I know you're a lyricist type of guy. So if you are interested, hop on and we'll write some beautiful emotional lyrics. Yeah, I'll, I'll hop in for sure. I would love to. And oh, I can yes. imagine you, me, and Pooh Ninja together, that's... <laughs> The holy trinity of lyricists, yeah, pretty we're, much. Yeah, we're the Max Martins of the YouTube songwriters. Absolutely, that will. That's going to blow people's minds. Wow. Yeah, they definitely will. All right, from uh, Max Martins and UK politics to Weekend Watch, where we actually do go to UK, and more on that in just a second. Watch it. 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 Video. It's not like you have anything else to do. Yep. This week's Weekend Watch comes from Colin Scott or CS Guitars. Our good friend Colin had a really cool video where he takes a Squire Strat and turns it into an Iron Maiden guitar. And I gotta say, I didn't know he was such a big Iron Maiden fan, but this is really cool. He basically just goes for a guitar that looks like Adrian Murray's strat that he's really well known for. Uh, I I love this kind of mod projects. I love watching other people taking guitars and like modding them into something else, both like uh, you know looks wise, but also like so they go for a certain type of sound or something like that. And Colin is honestly like one of the best doing that. This isn't his first mod project. He has also like built several guitars for auction, for charity and stuff like that. And yeah, I really enjoyed this video and I love mod projects on YouTube. So also his playing is really good on these. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's a great player and a great presenter and he looks proper oh, yes. metal in this video. I've not watched it yet, but I'm definitely going to. I was a little bit confused at first when you started talking about it because the guitar that I saw was not the guitar that I was expecting to see because for me, the famous uh. Iron Maiden Strat is the the other signature model which you can buy new at the moment, which has, it's like a Sunburst Strat with um, stacked single coil size pickups in it. I don't even know which mm. of the guitar players it's a signature model for, but it it often comes up in my searches when I'm searching for a Strat with a single coil-sized humbucker in the bridge because there's not that many out there. But the guitar mm. that Colin is doing is one that I've never even seen before, and it looks really pretty cool. So yeah. I'm looking forward to watching this video and see what he's done with it. I'm sure he's done an amazing job because he knows his way around the, the mods bench, but exciting times. Yeah. And I'd also like to see him dressed like that in public, too. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. Uh, uh, The amount of work he puts in... And those wristbands. Yeah, that and like the amount of work he puts in his videos. And I don't think he has like a proper workshop or anything. Like there's a single room where he does all these projects and has all the tools and everything. I really, really respect that. And... Uh, This video also made me want to get back to my Jazz Master build. Life's been so busy that I haven't been able to do that, which sucks. But this video doesn't seamless transition into that. What on me? So, yeah. Fun watch. I think a lot of you people will enjoy it. Go check it out. 
there's always absolutely good time for some mod projects. So be sure to check this out. Links in the show notes as always. And that wraps up Cat Pick Fridays episode number 37. 37, yes. I will go now and find out what on earth I'm supposed to do with our car and stuff like that, but that's my problem, not yours. I don't know why I'm saying that. I'm just saying. Thank you, Richard, for yeah. joining me once again. Though. Almost like it's my fault, <laughs> somehow. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's your fault that my car is broken. And Unlikely. what else? Everything we mentioned, all the links and stuff like that in the show notes, and with to support what we do in the show notes as well as is a special discount for the Get Songs Done songwriting course for podcast listeners. Again, you can find all the information in the show notes. This say show notes. Yes, the show notes. Thank you so much for watching. Bye, podcast. Bye, podcast. <laughs>